Oh, so here's the interesting gun. What can be said about this gun? Homely, quirky, historic, effective. I mean, it is a gun that brought down Bonnie and Clyde, but it's a pretty interesting gun. So let's talk about the Remington Autoloading Repeating Rifle, which then became known as the Model 8, which then became known as the Model 81, which was America's first semi-automatic deer rifle. Hey, how's it going? Welcome back to the channel. Hope everyone's having a fantastic week. It's been a long winter. I think everyone's looking forward to spring. I know I am. But we've turned the corner. We're almost there. We're on the downhill slope. In the meantime, let's talk about guns. You know, as a kid, especially in the fall time, Right, you're, you're looking forward to deer hunting. You're looking forward to hunting season coming, getting out the hunting gear. And I would go down, you know, look in the gun cabinet as a kid, looking at the guns and start dreaming about fall time. And I can remember one gun in particular in the gun cabinet that was kind of quirky. It's an odd looking gun. You could almost mistake it for a shotgun. Great big fat barrel, big receiver, chunky gun. You know, just looked awkward. So it was this gun right here, the Remington Model 81. This one's chambered in 30 Remington, uh, but the predecessor to this gun was the Model 8. And then originally though, it was called the Remington Auto Loader Repeating Rifle. Say that three times fast. That's kind of wordy. Um, so Model 8, Model 81 is a lot easier to say. So to fully understand the evolution of this gun, we have to look back to the early 1900s. You know, the first semi-automatic rifles were blowback operated. And I believe the first one that was commercially available to sportsmen was the Winchester 1903. But the issue with that gun is it was underpowered. And even their larger centerfire cartridges were underpowered for even small deer in North America. And then we have John Browning. Through his work on the self-loading shotguns, uh, he developed what was known as the long stroke recoil operation. So John sold his patent to Remington in the early 1900s. And in 1906, Remington developed what was known as the Remington Autoloading Repeating Rifle. God, that's worthy. So it was originally chambered in 2530, 3235 Remington. And you know, th those were the days that the single shots and the lever actions rolled. And the, this gun was in direct competition with the Model 94, 3030 lever action, which was the most popular deer rifle at that time, and is arguably probably the most popular deer rifle that's ever existed. I mean, more people have shot deer with that than any other gun I can think of, and everyone's familiar with the 3030. So in 1911, Remington rebranded the Remington Auto Loading Repeating Rifle. That would get old saying all the time. Holy crap. Anyway, they rebranded that gun into the Model 8. So how'd they come up with the name Model 8? Well, basically they took all the models of guns that they had produced in numerical order, and that was the eighth one. So they call it the Model 8, not very clever, but uh, way less wordy than Remington Auto Loading Repeating Rifle. Way less wordy. So if we move forward to the mid 1930s, 1936, they rebranded it again. They, they had some more rebranding, and it became the, went from the Model 8 to the Model 81 which I have here in my hand. And the primary difference between the Model 8 and the Model 81 was they basically changed the foregrip and the stock. I believe they made the stock a little chunkier and the foregrip a little chunkier. Uh, and there's a little, a little more curvature uh, on the front of the stock and the Model 8s. Uh, but everything else pretty much remained the same. They did drop the 25 Remington. And then in 1940, they added the 300 Savage. And then I believe production stopped in the 1950s um, of this gun. So the action is what really makes this gun unique. You know, as I mentioned, it's a pretty novel design that John Browning came up with. And it's pretty interesting on how it works. Uh, when fired, the barrel and the bolt stay locked. The barrel slides back within the barrel jacket and there's a spring in the barrel jacket. 
end in towards the back of the guns. So the barrel and the bolt come back together. When they're all the way back, there's a carrier latch that catches the bolt. The barrel then separates from the bolt, goes forward. As it goes forward, it ejects the spent shell. Once forward, that carrier latch releases the bolt. The bolt then slides forward, catching the next shell in the mag, and then you're ready to fire again. Um, so watching one of these guns fired on video, especially in slow motion, it's pretty cool to watch the whole thing in action. So it seems very complex, and it is complex, um, but they were surprisingly reliable. And even looking at the bulk and the heft of this, especially the parts within the action and whatnot, to make a gun like this uh, nowadays would cost a fortune. Um, they work surprisingly well. So it's this action that allowed this gun to become the first semi-automatic deer rifle in America. So it was really revolutionary. So some other interesting features on this gun is the mag. So we have a single stack, five shot mag. It's not detachable and it's relatively complex. So when the gun's empty, you have to load them one by one. Uh, or you can use a stripper clip. I don't think a stripper would load this very good. No, seriously, you can use a stripper or you can use a stripper clip for to speed up the loading process. So there were some bigger mags available for law enforcement. I believe there was a single stack 15 shot mag that was available for law enforcement. So in fact, it was the Model 8 that was used by the Texas Ranger Jack Hamer and his posse uh, to take down Bonnie and Clyde. So how does the gun carry? Um, personally, I've never really carried this gun deer hunting and neither has my father. Um, I'll get into the story behind this gun in a minute, but it's quite awkward, quite heavy. I, just sitting here holding this, I feel like I'm, my biceps getting a workout. Uh, very, very hefty gun. Um, interestingly, John Browning designed the center point of this gun to be right where this mag is. So, to carry it right here, let's say if you're going to carry it down by your side, that mag is in the way. It makes it super awkward. You know, holding it forward, the gun wants to fall backwards. Holding, can't really hold it back here, it wants to fall forwards. And then on top of that, you've got a great big bolt sticking up the side. Right again, right where you would carry this if you're going to carry it down by your side. And not to mention it has a huge safety, which you have to reposition your hand to take the safety off. Um, easy to find. It would be easy to knock off with a pair of gloves. But yeah, very awkward gun to carry. Very heavy gun. Uh, but, you know, again, it was revolutionary for that time. Um, first semi-automatic deer rifle in America. I mean, I suppose you'd always carry it cradled. Um, sling, I'm sure you could come up with a sling. I'm not sure if there's any available, um, but I'm sure you could sling this gun some way, somehow. Um, you could always carry it cradled like that all day while we're talking about carrying it, is it breaks down pretty fast, pretty easily. What happens is you take this screw out of the forend, forend comes off, and the screw stays retained so you won't lose it. So when you remove the forend, there's a takedown lever that's hidden within the tunnel of the forend. That folds out, loosens a nut, that then allows you to remove the barrel from the rest of the gun. And if you reattach the forend to the barrel, you basically end up with two pieces of equal length and makes it break down basically like a single shot or double barrel shotgun and you can put it in a nice little case for transportation you know because you think back to the early 1900s uh, people were using trains and whatnot for transportation especially going into the back country and uh, breaking it down into two equal pieces and being able to put it into a case you know similar to a shotgun case that we'd put a single shot or a double barrel shotgun in uh, made transportation a breeze <music> So the cartridge on this gun, you know, it was a great cartridge for deer, especially in the Northeast. As I mentioned, it came in 25, 30, 32, 35, and then later on the 300 Savage, and they discontinued the, the uh, 25. This gun is a 30 Remington, and it's basically uh, a rimless 
3030. Uh, you know, the cartridge is basically obsolete now as far as factory loads are concerned. It is a very easy cartridge to reload, but if you look at a lot of reloading manuals, they leave the data on this cartridge completely out of the manual. And I know a lot of people will use the data from the 3030 to reload this ammo. You know, so it's a pretty easy gun to shoot. You know, I believe that this cartridge, it'll hold a three inch five shot group at 100 yards. So it's fairly accurate, you know, and it's reliable, especially considering the complexity of this gun. So 30 Remington can be a great cartridge for, for deer hunting in the Northeast. And you couple that with fast follow-up shots in a, in a self-loading rifle, you get a deer hunter's dream in the Northeast. Other than the fact you gotta carry it all day, that's kind of a deal breaker. So what's the story behind this gun? Um, you know I like guns that have a story behind them, I like guns that have history behind them. Guns that mean something. I know I've said that quite a bit. Um, that's because it's the truth. So this gun is from 1938. So you might ask, how do I know that? A couple ways. Obviously the serial number, you can look up the serial number in the database, give you an idea of the year it was made. Um, but also Remington put a two letter code on the jacket head. And you'll see sometimes three letters, but on this one there's two letters and they correspond to the month and the year that they were made. So this gun has a C and a G. Um, so the C stands for April, and the G stands for 1938. So, yeah, from 1938, and it was my great-grandfather's. And he was a big outdoorsman, big salmon fisherman, uh, big fly fisherman, and he passed away in 1940. Uh, so he didn't get to really deer hunt all that much with this. And he died a young man, so my grandfather was just a little boy. When my great-grandfather passed away, this gun was never used much by him. So my grandfather took over this, this gun. I don't think my grandfather had ever shot a deer with it. So my great grandfather that I know of had never shot a deer. My grandfather had never shot a deer with it. Um, the only deer that we know that have been shot with this gun were three deer shot by one of my grandfather's friends way up in Northern Maine. Uh, so that's the only deer that we've known that have been ever shot with this gun. I know my father has contemplated carrying this gun um, it would be an interesting gun to carry. It would be a, a lot of work to carry this gun all day long. Um, but you can see it's in excellent shape, actually. Uh, the stock and forend has been refinished. I believe my father did that himself. But there's hardly any bluing worn off the gun. I, my grandfather wasn't a serious deer hunter, so it didn't get used. It didn't get carried all that often, or at least not all that hard by him. So, you know, a lot of history behind this gun. Uh, pretty revolutionary, as I mentioned. You know, basically you can say this is the first semi-automatic deer rifle in America. And uh, as you may know, I'm pretty fond of my Remington Model 7400, chambered in 270, which is a semi-automatic. And this would be the very beginning. So you can say that, you know, the Model 8, Model 81, it was reliable, relatively accurate, an efficient way of hunting big game in North America. And look, if anyone has a story on hunting with a Model 8 or Model 81, you know, they're familiar with it, um, let me know in the comment section below. I'd like to hear, I'd like to hear a good deer story of uh, this gun being used. I'm sure they've taken a lot of deer over the years, uh, especially back in the day. Um, unfortunately, this gun hasn't, but maybe it will someday. So, hope you enjoyed it. Till next time, get outside. It's good for the soul. See ya.